this is a great week to be discussing the monarchy. Look at what's been happening in London. And look at what's been happening in Canberra. I feel a bit like a Greek Prime Minister choosing the present moment to ask for the return of the Elgin marbles. Still, the job has to be done. The debate has to be kept alive. And that's why I'm talking really about the monarchy rather than the republic. Polls show that royalty is relatively popular here, although the wedge of republicans still numbers about 40%. And when next somebody takes a poll, it might be found that the effect of last year's royal wedding and the Queen's visit might have started to wear off. What is interesting is the way the Jubilee has been so low-key here. The Prime Minister lit a beacon, Tony Abbott loyally by her side, and the Herald Sun, which in times past produced sumptuous volumes to mark royal occasions, produced a magazine format paperback. It is scarcely being rushed off the shop counters. The monarchy's time is past. Once it worked very well indeed, when the British began to give effective independence to the dominions, as they were styled, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa. And the royal family was the linchpin holding the whole show together. At a time when Australia boasted it was 98% British, the monarch and the family epitomised kinship and elevated it. The structures of government were becoming increasingly differentiated, but the royal family stood above it all, representing not only kinship, but also bonds of trust and affection. It paid dividends. As Menzies famously remarked in 1939, Great Britain has declared war, and as a result, Australia is at war. But times change. Australia now prides itself on being a successful multicultural society. And the British Commonwealth, in case you hadn't noticed, has become neither British, nor common, nor wealthy. <laughs> the question of the monarchy has been turned around. It is now no longer about the traditional tie with Britain. It's about us. We are all familiar with the Republican position. First, there's the egalitarian argument that a robust democracy should not be ruled by a hereditary monarch. And secondly, that we should have our own head of state, as other grown-up nations do. The monarchists, on the other hand, are smitten by the glories of our system of government. They went quiet on the Queen during the Republican referendum of 1999. At a pinch, they will argue that she's really extrinsic to the system, merely a device for appointing the Governor-General, who, they claim when it suits them, is really our head of state. Australia is really, quote, a crowned republic, they say. Now, to some extent, these two arguments shoot past each other. The monarchists are really Westminsterites, valuing our system of government. The republicans, insistent that our self-respect and the full respect of other nations demands that we have our own head of state. Once there might have been a way of reconciling these two positions. And what got me thinking along these lines was the case of Brazil, and I now want to spend a minute or two explaining a very interesting set of circumstances. When Napoleon invaded Spain and Portugal, the Portuguese king looked about and decided to hop it to Rio, the capital of the big Portuguese colony of Brazil. The whole court moved, holus bolus, to Rio, where it stayed for 15 years. The time came for the king to return to Lisbon, whereupon he left his son in charge as viceroy. The politics of the situation soon dictated that the son suddenly decided to cut links with Portugal and declare himself Dom Pedro I, Emperor of Brazil. So he did and was duly succeeded by his son. Thus a monarchy was established in Brazil from a sprig of the Portuguese royal house. 
This was no tin pot affair. The empire in Brazil lasted from 1822 to 1889. The memory of it endured as a golden age so strongly that when Brazil was casting around for a new system of government after a long period of dictatorship, just 20 years ago, a referendum was held to ask whether people wanted the monarchy restored. It was lost. The idea of a separate King of Australia has been floated. See my absorbing article, The Lost Option, in the Griffith Review. It's been there as a secondary option even in the recent past. The Republican Donald Horne, more concerned that we should have our own head of state than anything else, approved the idea, but he thought it bizarre. Interestingly, there's a move afoot to make Prince Harry King of Canada. The Canadians, while remaining a monarchy, specifically did not tie themselves inevitably to the reigning British sovereign. For a long idea, sorry, for a long time, such ideas were pure fantasy. There was a doctrine that the crown was not divisible. It was the quid pro quo, the fair exchange, for the, for the, for the dominions having effective independence. But when, in the 1950s, it was enacted that the Queen was separately sovereign of her different realms, there was no great rush to the doors, except, of course, in South Africa. At that time, republicanism here was less about a vision of Australia than a remembrance of the wrongs of Aaron. Australia, still fearful of Asia, didn't want to weaken the link. Britain might still be called upon to come to our defence. At the same time, the British would have regarded any idea of separation, republican or monarchical, as impertinent. Neither side wanted it. When Prince Charles spent two terms at Geelong Grammar's Timber Top in 1966, it seemed to recognise current realities, an enlarged place for Australia in the Commonwealth scheme of things. But then things moved quickly. The massive immigration program began to transform Australia into a multicultural society. Britain pulled out her troops from the region and simultaneously began to pay more attention to its own by joining what became the European Union. It was a fairly spectacular divergence. Interestingly enough, while Gough Whitlam's name became associated with the Republic, he was, for all his Australian nationalism, a reluctant Republican. Indeed, he believed that the Queen should act as fully as she could as Queen of Australia. And it was the case that more royal visits occurred during his Prime Ministership than in any other. It was the action of Sir John Kerr on the 11th of November 1975 that made Gough a Republican. Here, let me make one thing clear, clearer than most monarchists are prepared to concede. The question of continuing with the monarchy in Australia is an entirely different one from whether the Brits should still have it. As, it is, as has been pointed out, the polls haven't been so highly in its favour for 15 years. In England, 90% want the, monarchy, want the monarchy to continue after the Queen's death. That's not so surprising. The monarchy is the ultimate statement of British difference from Europe and, for that matter, from America. Then, should Scotland become independent, as it may, the Scots might agree to Elizabeth remaining their queen. No hope whatsoever with a POM president. And, as we saw last year with the Queen's visit to Ireland, she could deliver an apology, sorry, express regret, the Queen doesn't do apologies, precisely because Standing there wearing a royal tiara, she seemed to be apologising for her ancestors. Imagine, by way of contrast, how hollow it would have been if the Queen had made the apology to the stolen generations. My husband and I, no, not really, it had to come from one of ourselves. So, the Australian situation is different. And a number of things have been tried here. We had a royal governor-general in the 1940s, 
the Duke of Gloucester. But even John Howard conceded that nowadays the Governor-General would have to be an Australian citizen. So in that way, the monarchy cannot, as Whitlam hoped, become closer to the Australian people. Another idea, popular in the 50s, was that perhaps the Queen could spend a certain amount of time each year in the major Commonwealth countries. Not practical. A third idea is the local monarchy, which would at least have the advantage of keeping the constitutional system intact. But that idea seems absurd and has very few supporters. An Australian monarchy, if now established, would probably end up just a staging post on the road to a republic. This leaves us with the republic and still in disagreement as to how this might best be affected. We could continue with the status quo, but this will always be less satisfactory than it is in England. There the monarchy stands as a symbol of continuity or national unity. So clearly is this the case that over the last century the monarchy has been careful to align itself with progressive constitutional reform. Tony Blair implemented versions of Home Rule for Scotland and for Wales, slightly different in each case. No opposition from the ballots, even though it ran the risk of turning Britain into the untied kingdom. He also transformed the House of Lords, radically increasing the number of elected peers. No opposition from the palace. In Australia, though, the situation is very different. Any future radical change in our political system would, sooner or later, call into question the title and role of the Governor-General, which helps to explain why Conservatives, over and beyond any attachment they may feel to the Queen personally, know in their bones that the continuation of Australia as an absentee monarchy helps ensure that our existing institutions chug on unchallenged. And let's not kid ourselves. The Governor-General cannot function like the Queen in some crucial respects. In fact, at, uh, until 1974, I think it was, the Governor-General couldn't even represent Australia outside Australia until that was changed specially. In England, there's a weekly meeting between the Queen and the Prime Minister of the day. It's of some real use to compel the nation's leader to have that discussion with somebody placed above politics. Mrs Thatcher must have felt as though she was going to confession. But since the Australian Governor-General is appointed by the Prime Minister, there can't really be a similar weekly conversation in Canberra. In the end, the Governor-General has little independent standing. And as many of you will have noticed in printed documents and books, increasingly she doesn't even have a decent pair of capital letters to her name. Meanwhile, as the British monarchy softens, good God, they were tapping their feet and Charles clanking his sword to the strains of the hornpipe at the end of the Jubilee pageant. As the British monarchy softens, it will also become more English. The monarchy has been projecting itself increasingly in the English context as a caring institution, which in the long term may have the effect of localising it. Already it has been noticed that around the palace the tones of Eton and Harrow are being elbowed out by more conventional middle-class accents. As the monarchy becomes more English, it will also become more exotic to Australians. That may not lessen its appeal so very much, but the appeal is, as much as anything, that of the most famous woman in the world. The Queen has too much dignity to be a celebrity, and Charles too much stuffiness. But Wills and Kate, for the moment, qualify. Older Australians may have some affection for the woman who has been on the throne and on the stamps and on the coins all their lives. As Malcolm Turnbull memorably put it, even many Republicans are Elizabethans. But the young see her differently. One hoonette was overheard talking to her girlfriend when the Queen was in Melbourne, wondering what all the fuss was about. It's not as if she's Lady Gaga or anything. As the enthusiasm for Princess Mary 
Australia's own royal, as she's often described, unintentionally demonstrates enthusiasm for royalty is shallow. Politics generally, as well as being raucous, have become shallow. Politics, you will have noticed, is the name of a clothing store down the road. Freedom is what one bank has presumed to call its home loan, its housing loan. So Charles will have an uphill battle <coughs> trying to be a celebrity when he comes to the throne. No wonder he's starting to behave like a stand-up comic. We need the Republic. The perpetuation of the monarchy may have encouraged a passivity about our institutions. Right now, Australians seem to be suffering a double disillusion, recoiling from both leaders. The result, unfortunately, is likely to be a lot of people turned off politics for the foreseeable future. Already, membership of both political parties has been in sharp decline. And the other day, there was an alarming poll result published in The Australian. It claimed that only 39% of Australians, aged from 18 to 39, were prepared to say that democracy is better than any other form of government. Almost a quarter said, for someone like me, it doesn't matter what kind of government we have. Fantastic. Australia now faces enormous problems, some of which are only just beginning to be perceived. We know about China, which John Howard viewed as a banquet set out before us. The Chinese might see it the other way around. And then there's Indonesia, which few of us realise is now on track to become the world's fourth largest economy within 30 years. Where is Bahasa Indonesian in our schools? This is not the place to talk about our domestic problems, but the fact that we now lead the world in gambling per capita should be better known and acted upon. If we're not careful, given the indifference mentioned earlier, we could quietly slip into the third world. We could become ruled by an oligarchy grouped around mining companies. Now, a republic would not save us from any of this, but it could become a vital part of a move to revitalise Australian politics, ending the disengagement, which has to end. For a start, let's keep it simple. Let's just go for a change in the Governor Generalship, styling the holder President. She or he could be elected by a two-thirds parliamentary majority, which requires bipartisan support. If that is not acceptable, then there could be direct election which has worked quite well in Ireland. As it happens, we have had a model for a future president before our eyes. Present at the memorial service for the victims of the bushfires in Melbourne at the beginning of 2009 was Her Royal Hoarseness, Princess Anne. The princess made a speech, which was worthy, and got most applause. But Although there are still people who maintain that Australia cannot come up with an appropriate person, the star turn, intelligent and sympathetic, was Quentin Bryce's. Why should she, or someone like her, not be president? She has brought both flair and dignity to her office. And why did people not see the absurdity of Anne's announcement that she brought us a message from the Queen of Australia? A real boomerang, that one. Australia was so far away. Why couldn't the message have come from the Queen and the people of Britain? It would have meant something then. Because the people of Britain are who Elizabeth II really represents, not us.